Good morning, everybody. Namo Tassa Bhagavatu Namo Samma Samma Tassa Namo Tassa Bhagavatu Namo Samma Samma Tassa Namo Tassa Bhagavatu Namo Samma Samma Tassa Sukhodhanam Pado Sukhasaddam Vadesana Sukhasangasya Samadhi Samadhanam Tapo Sukho Dear friends, today is a very special day for the entire Buddhist world and particularly important day for the Bhavana Society. We are celebrating today two things. One, the such celebration, that is the universal celebration. Second is very special to Bhavana society. That is because this is the 40th anniversary of the establishment of this place. We will have talks on this topic in the afternoon. There will be other speakers. They will come soon and they give talks on that event this afternoon. This morning, <coughs> I want to speak on <coughs> the Vesak celebration. I recited one stanza in Pali, which means the birth of the Buddhas is happy occasion. Happy is the teaching of true Dhamma. Happy is the unity of the Sangha. Happy is the discipline of the united. Happy is the birth of the Buddhas is also extremely significant for the entire universe. I want to scratch the surface of the greatness of the Buddha. My topic today is what makes the Buddha great. Friends, nobody on earth can talk adequately on how great the Buddha is. We all simply can scratch the surface of the greatness of the Buddha. His wisdom and compassion. For his wisdom, particularly for his compassion, I want to mention something that probably may marvel people. He ordained Devadatta. You know, most people know Devadatta. Some people question these days, knowing who the Bodhisattva Devadatta is, 
they say Buddha made a mistake because of the time he was ordained, he has not had any friendly encounter with the Buddha. Buddha knew even before he attained enlightenment, even while he was lay person, he knew who Devadatta was. Evil-minded, <laughs> Knowing all this, he ordained him out of compassion. Had he not been ordained, he would have been worse and would have destroyed his attainment of liberation. Buddha knew that Devanatha, first part of his previous life, Devanatha spent as a disciplined monk, practiced meditation, attained jhanas, poor jhana. He attained superhuman, gave him superhuman knowledge. Then he started abusing it to challenge the Buddha. Then started his ruin from the time he started challenging the Buddha. And he says then he went down here. When he passed away, Buddha said, this man would become a Pacheta Buddha in future by the name of Sattisa. Buddha created this opportunity for him to become Pacheta Buddha in future by ordering him out of compassion. This aspect is a very noble, wonderful quality of the Buddha. He practiced, he had a plan. He realized the truth. He knew what it is and put it into practice. That's called Satya Kicha Hatha. Satya is the truth. He knew the four normal truths. That is the theory. He knew the theory very well. Then he knew how to apply the truth theory. He applied it and found it to be perfect. Then he perfected the practice that he called Hatha, completely. This is very scientific approach. First he made the theory and put the theory into practice and found the results. That is what any scientist would do. With this experiment, this realization, he started teaching. That is why as soon as he attained enlightenment, when he came to teach to Benares, he said, so long as I have not attained full enlightenment, I have not declared to the world that I have attained enlightenment. The moment I realized 
the truth, attain full enlightenment by, my, by myself, destroy all possible doubts. I came to the world to declare to the world that I have attained full enlightenment. That is how he began. With this trust and confidence in himself, trust and confidence in the Dharma, he delivered his sermons the same thing for 45 years. Same thing. Repeated. He repeated 45, the same thing for 45 years and delivered 84,000 sermons, approximately five sermons a day. Why so many sermons? Why did he repeat so many times? Because the world is made up of so many different types of people. He knew the audience when we, when we see you, I don't know who you are. How much time you know? What kind of spiritual faculties you have developed? I don't know. But when the Buddha talked to a group, even thousands of people, each person thought that Buddha talked to him or her. Each person, because he spoke to people, to their brain and heart, and they knew how to apply that. At the end of his sermon, most people at least attained the first state of enlightenment, called stream entry, at least that. <clears throat> Buddha was very much like a very compassionate, loving mother. He said to monks, because attain full enlightenment and then go out and teach. Don't go out to teach without knowing the Dhamma. That is why when he delivered the first sermon, he did not send bhikkhus to teach Dhamma. Because after the first sermon, only one attained the stream entry. He wanted to make sure that his disciples go out to teach the Dhamma with full, full knowledge and confidence. Then he gave the second sermon, Anatta Lakkana Sutta. After giving the second sermon, all the five monks attained full enlightenment. But the number was not that much to send out. Very small number, five. Then he waited till others came and joined the order and then made 60 monks, all of whom had attained full enlightenment. That is Aditya Parya Sutta. After delivering that discourse, Buddha knew well that each and every one of these 60 monks had attained full enlightenment. And then he sent them out, asking them not to go two of them together, go each one separately in different directions. That is how he started. You can see the beautiful plan, wise plan, intelligent plan. 
one day, one monk came to him and asked him to give, asked the Buddha to give him brief instructions so that he can digest it very quickly. After giving brief instruction, this monk, Buddha knew that monk was ready, immediately he attained the enlightenment. Such people are called Upadikanyas. Those who have, those who attain enlightenment by listening to first sermon, first talk, first instruction for the first time, attain enlightenment. This monk's name is Purna. I think you all, most Buddhists know his name, Purna. Buddha said, Purna, now you have got instructions. Are you ready to go somewhere to teach? Yes, Venerable Sir. Where are you going? I want to go to Sunaparanta. Purna, Sunaparanta people are very wild. They are not very polite. They will abuse you verbally. Then he said, Venerable Sir, I think they must be very excellent people. If they simply abuse me without beating me up, then Buddha said, Purna, suppose to they beat you up, what are you going to do? Venerable Sir, that is wonderful. They are now excellent, truly wonderful. Because these people would not beat me with clubs and rocks and wound me. Suppose Purna they beat you up with clubs and rocks and wound you, what am I going to do? Venerable sir, these are really excellent people, truly excellent, wonderful. So long as they beat me up with rocks and clubs and wound me, without killing me, they're excellent. Suppose Kuna they kill you, how are you going to defend? So they say, Venerable Sir, I know certain monks look for assailants, look for murderers to kill them. That reminds us a story of monks homiciding and suiciding. In the story, when Buddha delivered the sermon on the benefit of the practice of 32 parts of the body, the lower surface of the body, some monks who have not attained enlightenment misunderstood the misunderstood his instructions and did not know how to practice this. They began to feel the body is ugly, dirty, loathsome, repulsive, and some of them committed suicide by themselves and homicide killed others. Puna knew this. Puna knew this. And said to the world, sir, some people are looking for assailants, murderers, to kill themselves. I don't have to do that. When I go there, they come to me automatically, voluntarily. Puna said, Puna, you are excellent. You are my real son. You have patience. 
you understood the dhamma go that is the place for you to go then the pune went to sunaparant within very short period he converted 500 people to buddhism because of his patience understanding his approach using the local language instead of his own vernacular he used people's language they had to people's heart and the mind and converted 500 of them and at the same time he soon after he passed away other monks having heard of this sad story of his death came to the Buddha and asked then the Buddha said what happened to Buddha? Buddha said don't worry Buddha had been full enlightenment he has converted 500 people within a very short period of time Buddha knew this but the new this is the way to approach people any us <coughs> minds when you move with people yathapi bhavaro bhupam varna ganda mahetayam phaleti radamadaya Eva Gaji Munichari Move with people, among people, like a bee. Bee gathers honey from the flower without injuring the flower. Without injuring, destroying its color or fragrance. Even so, a sage goes his way collecting arms from people without hurting them. Collecting arms, they go not hurting people. Take the arms gone and go from house to house. People may offer very little food. Friends, I know this very well because in my entire life in Sri Lanka, I spend on arms food. I spend my life using my arms ball and going from house to house, collecting food. I I had my meals all my life from the day I got in. Second day I took big arms bone, put in a case, put around my neck and went from out of 60 houses. People love to offer you very much. Poor people, but offered very little food. And I returned, my arms bone was full. In 2000, I went to Germany. I used to go there very often every year. Went to a place called Hanoi with my arms board. There was another German monk. This was uh, called Expo, City, Expo 2000. 100,000 people were supposed to attend every day. When we went in the morning with arms bowl, people thought that we also were some exhibits wearing rope, taking arms bowl, going as an as exhibits. <laughs> went to Nepal pavilion, there we waited for five, six minutes, no food, 
They came and tried to put some money in my arm for it. I said, we don't need money. Only if we have cooked food, we accept it. Then they brought a very tiny little food, which was not enough. Then he walked another 100 yards, about 100 yards, and found what? Toy restaurant. They invited us, made special food, and put the heart for. And then you walked about another 100 yards, looking for a place to sit down. Then we found what? Sri Lankan restaurant. They said, where are the Don't go anywhere. Come here inside. Sit here and eat. And they gave us Sri Lankan delicious food. And said, you go and see the exhibits and come back. Even tomorrow morning, if you come here, he will be here to sit and on board. So my arm goal is better than massage expense. I got my food without hurting anybody. So Buddha said, Dick course, give up unskillfulness. Give up unskillfulness. It is possible to give up unskillfulness. If it were not possible to give up unskillfulness, I would not say because give up unskillfulness. Since it is possible to give up unskillfulness, I say because give up. Very loving, compassionate mother, tell a little child, my dear darling, don't do this. Don't do this. You can stay without doing that. It is possible for you to do it. Out of compassion for us, for the sake of because give up unskillfulness. You can do that. If you cannot do that, I will not ask you to do it. To give it, 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 it up. If giving up unskillfulness causes uh, uh, causes uh, detriment, danger, problem, and suffering, I would not say because we are unskillfulness. Since abandoning our skill, unskillfulness bring benefit and happiness, I say because we are unskillfulness. Then again he said because cultivate skillfulness it is possible to cultivate skillfulness. If it is not possible to cultivate skillfulness, I would not say because cultivate skillfulness. Since it is possible to cultivate skillfulness, I, I say because cultivate skillfulness. If cultivating skillfulness, causes detriment and suffering, I would not ask you to cultivate skillfulness. Because cultivate skillfulness. When you cultivate skillfulness, it would cause peace and happiness. So I ask you to cultivate skillfulness. Friends, when we cultivate skillfulness, what does Buddha get? Buddha had, uh, had all the attained enlightenment. He doesn't get profit. 
He doesn't share anything with us. It is for our benefit. Buddha asked us to cultivate spiritfulness. So friends, this is how the Buddha urged us, encouraged us to do good things for out of compassion for our own benefit. When Buddha was not very enthusiastic in converting people, not enthusiastic, whether people accept his teaching or not, Buddha remains equanimous. He maintained equanimity, upekha. He mentioned it several times that some people listen to his sermons, some people do not listen to his sermons. Whether people listen to his sermons or not, Buddha would not be disturbed, upset, disappointed. But out of utmost compassion, he urged us to practice that. When somebody comes to him with great earnestness to become his follower, Buddha could not grab him very quickly and convert him to his teaching. He would ask then if, if, if that person coming from another tradition, Buddha would ask him to go under four months probation. Four months probation. But sometimes Buddha made some exception to certain people. Buddha asked monks, monks, if since you don't have knowledge and vision to read others' mind, we have not developed the ability to read others' mind. I ask you to investigate me using your eyes and ears. Using your eyes and ears, you observe me. When you observe me, using your eyes, use your eyes to See how I move. Use your ears to hear what I say. Then you may, you may if you conclude, no defiled state cognized, cognizable through eyes or ears is present in this person. Then you accept me. Or if you do not see any mixed state, that is, sometimes you behave well, sometimes not behave well. That is 100% true with regard to certain unenlightened individuals. They present one image in public. Another image in secret. Buddha did not have this kind of double standard. In private as well as in public, his thoughts, words, deeds are concordant. They were not discordant. When somebody observed him, 
using eyes and ears, that is what they can find in the Buddha. So, when you investigate the Tathagata, you see whether the Tathagata has very just recently attained its purity and this loftiness, or he has attained this purity and loftiness long, long ago, matured in it, perfect in it. You can see that. When he investigates the Buddha in this way, see whether he is delighted with reputations or he dep is depressed when he is when he lost his reputation. Buddha never lost his reputation. He always had the same reputation. See whether he, he is uh, delighted or delighted when he gained and this depressed and disappointed, grief stricken when he lose. You observe it. Whether he gained or lost, his behavior is the same. Equanimous. So when you investigate like this, you can never find a scrap of weakness in him. He always remains to be perfect. When you when you associate with him, you can see whether he is approachable or not. You know, most uh, famous people, people with power, are very difficult to approach. But the Buddha was so simple and humble. That anybody, even a little child, can approach him without any fear. That is why when the Balananda, when the Buddha was Buddha took only two hours a day to rest, twenty-two hours he worked. When he took two hours to rest, when the Balananda took when the Balananda took care of him for 25 years. He had a club on his hand. He hold in the club, he walk around his booty to protect the Buddha. <laughs> because even while he was taking rest, somebody can approach him. He is open ready to help, ready to give his subjects. That is why when he was passing, going to pass away, he was lying in, in pain, he had diarrhea, dysentery, and he was utterly dehydrated. Physically, he is very weak and just going to pass away, then he heard somebody coming to crush him. I want to see the Buddha, I want to see the Buddha. Then the Balana said, Oh, no, 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 he's very weak, very weak. Buddha overheard this conversation and said, Ananda, let him come, let him come. That was Subhadda. Subhadda came and Buddha gave him instructions. Subhadda gave enlightenment. That was his last disciple. Even at that moment, his death was very on the verge of his death. He gave instructions. So, uh, since Buddha asked monks to give monk permission 
to investigate him using their eyes and ears. There was a man called Brahma Yu, 120 years old. He had a disciple called Purana. He asked Purana to go and watch the Buddha. Purana went and spent seven months with the Buddha, observing his behavior. He was following the Buddha like his shadow, <laughs> always behind him, watching, keeping his eyes on him, bending his ears to hear what he says. Seven months, and he did find a scruple of weakness in him. When he came and reported to the Buddha, reported to Brahmayu, Brahmayu said three times, Namotasya Bhagavatu Varato Samvasambuddhasya. Three times, bow down to the area where Buddha lived. By hearing Buddha's purity, honesty, mindfulness. Buddha was always mindful. He was so mindful that this Brahmayu's disciple Purana <coughs> saw his movement walking. Mindfully he walked. Mindfully he sat down. Mindfully he moved his hands. Mindfully he ate. Mindfully he drank. Mindfully he spoke. Mindfully he sat down. Everything he did with mindfulness, with clear comprehension. That is what he taught us in Mahasatipatta Sutta. Gajanto Gajami to Pajana, the Tito or the Tomi to Pajana, and he said, No, I did not meet the Pajana. Sayan was Sayan or Mita Pajana. Sanga de Patati, you are the Sampajana Kari, or the Afiti, the Saiti, the Sampajani Kari, or the and so forth. Walking forward, walking backward, turning sideways. Eating, drinking, munching, chewing, even using bathrooms, you know, call in the whole of nature, wearing robes, talking, even in silence. Be mindful. That's what he observed, he did. And from his personal practice, he showed the world how to practice Dhamma. His personal behavior was an example, a beacon, model for the world to follow. He lived mindfully, he passed away mindfully. He was so mindful, you know, he practiced mortification six years. Six years he practiced self mortification. During the entire six years, he made mindful. It is said in books that many people thought that he was dead. He was so weak, reduced to skeleton, so emaciated, reduced himself to skeleton. And everybody thought when he lied down, everybody thought that he was dead. Even at that time, he maintained his mindfulness. It is reported in Mahasriyananda Sutta, in Aryapariyasa Sutta, many suttas. It is reported that this is how I practice mindfulness. Even every, even while he is lying down, he was, he lied down with mindfulness. And therefore, uh, nobody could find any fault in him. I said uh, that he never rushed to convert people. I want to tell one story. 
Deus não me disse de viver no estoy. Deus não me recorda o Pali. O Pali era o palavra de gigantes. E eles tinham gigantes como discípulos de Jiga Tapasi. Ele veio para ver o Buda e teve uma conversa sobre Kamma. Jiga Tapasi foi convinced that Buddha was right, but he did not want to accept it. He went back and reported to Niganda. Niganda had a very, very weak, powerful disciple called Upali. Upali said, let me go and talk to Gautama. I will argue with him and prove that Niganda is right, Buddha was wrong. So he went and had, and had a discussion. He said to the Buddha, I'm just summarizing it, long story, summarizing long story to a very brief story is very difficult. That's what I try. I try to struggle because the story is very long. I struggle to summarize it. Summary is this. He asks, which is most powerful, verbal action, physical action, verbal action, or mental action? Buddha said, mental action. Upadhi said, no, physical action. Physical action is more powerful, most important. And Buddha said, uh, at the very beginning, Buddha told Upadhi, Upadhi, you and I can have a discussion. If you stay, stay your ground, don't shake your ground. Stay your ground. Hold to your view. We discuss. So they agreed. On that promise, they continue discussion. And the Buddha proved to Upali that mental action is more powerful than physical action. It is the Buddha who said, Chetana Habiti Kamma Madhara. It is the thought that is Kamma. It is the thought that becomes a Kamma. Not the word, not the deed. Why? Because the word and deed arise from the thought. You first think, then verbalize, and put it into action. This is the real procedure. Start everything in the mind. Manu Purbhangava Dhamma. Mind is a forerunner. So, Buddha convinced Upali. Then, Upali said at the end, it is Act 7, when the person Act 7, your first Explanation is self convinced to me that you are right, but your style of talking is so amazing. You are such a wonderful orator, wonderful teacher. I love your style. That is why I went on talking a little bit more to get more to listen to you. I become your follower. Upali. You are a very famous person. You are known to everybody in the city. A person of your caliber, your reputation, your honor, don't jump into conclusion like this to accept, to, 
to follow me. Then Upadhi said, Venerable Sir, I take your refuge for the second time. First time he took refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha by listening to his style of teaching, by convincing him. Second time he took refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha for telling him to think carefully. And he said, Venerable Sir, had I gone to another religious teacher and told him that I wanted to become his follower, he would have taken me to the street in a procession, telling the world, look, such and such a famous Greek person became my follower. He would have taken me into the street. Now you ask me to think it twice, think twice before accepting. For this reason, when I said, I take your refuge, second time. Then Buddha said, oh dear Pali, you are Nikanta's follower. Continue your support to them. You have been supporting them. Continue that. Don't stop that. Then the is marvelous, wonderful, sir. I have heard that you ask your disciples to make all offerings to you and your disciples. Now I am hearing from you now with my own ears that you are asking me to support Nigantas as well. Then I say, take your refuge for the third time. He took refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha three times. That's what we do today. Dutiya Buddha Dharma Gajda, Dutiya Buddha Dharma Gajda, Tatiya Buddha Dharma Gajda. He said that. So that he took refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha after convincing, after convincing, after the conviction that the Buddha was perfect, great, noble, pure, and holy. We take refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha not knowing anything. Taking refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha with that kind of conviction is called avecca prasada. Avecca prasada. Avecca means knowledge. Prasada means becoming clear, trusting, developing, having faith. So, you see, the Buddha was not rushed to convert people. Buddha gave chance to people to think. Buddha is the one who uplifted our dignity and honor, human dignity and honor, respect. Buddha did not say that human beings are miserable. Buddha always uplifted, elevated their honor and dignity. So he always gave us a chance to think. Very famous is very famous sutta that is most famous and least understood. And most famous and most misinterpreted discourse is Kalama Sutta. When somebody does anything wrong, they said, you can do anything Buddha asks you not to believe even, don't believe even the Buddha himself. They say that. That's completely wrong. They say, don't believe even in me. They say that. But Buddha never said that don't believe in me. This is just to get away with whatever mischievous things they do. But that is the discourse 
Buddha gave to Kalas a chance to think with before they jump to a conclusion. Think twice before you accept anything. In that discourse, I want to conclude, I have a short period now before the next item. I have so many things to say, but as I mentioned at the beginning, it's extremely impossible for any human beings to scratch even the scratch the surface of the greatness of the Buddha. On this occasion, on his birthday, how can we ignore that? Even if though even though we cannot do it, let us try. So I try to I, I, I make little effort to bring out some of the wonderful, noble, great qualities of the Buddha. Uh, so before conclusion, I want to mention, I want to conclude that Kala Sutta's last statement. Buddha said, this is very beautiful. Buddha said, if there is no, if somebody thinks that there is no rebirth, don't worry. If there is no rebirth, if you do evil things now, evil things you do now, you somewhere here. Any evil thought, the word did you commit, you suffer. Not me, not the Buddha. You don't have to believe in rebirth. But in this very life, you suffer. If there is labor, you suffer twice. <laughs> now and then, next. On the other hand, even if there is no labor, if you do good, practice metta, practice meditation, be generous, be compassionate, have understanding, patience, tolerance, you enjoy this life. Don't have to worry about rebirth. Enjoy very, this is a dependent origination law, law of dependent origination. When you get angry now, you suffer. When you practice metta now, you are happy. If there is free birth, you are happy now as well as you are happy next. Either Nandati, Pencha Nandati, Katapunya Ubayata Nandati. You enjoy here now, or you enjoy then after death. And therefore, my time is up. And thank you very much for coming to celebrate my Buddha's triple holy noble day, birth, enlightenment, and passing away. All these three events took place on full moon day of May. We call it Vesak. And uh, thereby you uh, participated in this and gained a lot of merits. By the power of this merits, may you all be well, happy, and peaceful and live long in good death to do wonderful, noble things in your life. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> No, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
All this took place on full moon day of May. That is why it is so significant, so auspicious to all the Buddhists, especially to all Buddhists and in general to the entire world, including divine and humans. So we all brought this food, gifts, flowers, all this we brought to offer to the Buddha and afterward the community of Sangha, then the community will participate in this dark ceremony. Now let us decide stanzas to offer the Buddha.
Okay. Thank you very much for your all for making here. In here, I can see something covered uh, in this wall. So it looks like something very significant because of this is a 40th anniversary of Bahrain society. So founding members, all are not here, but two of them are here. So I would like to invite uh, Venerable Yoga Vachara Rahula to come here to unveil all these pictures. I don't know what they are. So you see it. <laughs> <laughs> this Bhante is the Bhante who was uh, next to Bhante G. 22 years he was the vice abbot in this Brahmana society, and uh, he's like uh, right disciples of Bhante G. So I would like to kindly invite the Yoga Bhavala to unveil these pictures. I don't know who are they. Okay. <laughs> Look like that middle mark is here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. In here, you can see Bante Gunaratha Bante Ji, our teacher, and Bante Raula and Matthew Lichin. These three of No one can forget them. If you are talking about the Bahamana Society. Uh, in 1982 was the first year that Bahamana registered as an organization. Bahamana Society registered as an organization, particularly Bhante Gia, teacher, and Matthew Fitch. Somehow, a few years later, Bhante Gia met the Bhante Rahula. He was in Sri Lanka at that time, somehow Bhante traveling to Sri Lanka, they met together. Bhante Rahula get to know Bhante Ji is building a monastery, Bahamana monastery. The name was Dhamma village. And so Bhante Rahula was interested to come to see the place. Not, he did not want to stay here. He wanted to just to come and see the place. Mm -hmm. So Bhante Ji had been right, okay. Anytime you can come, but he was uh, it was it uh, on that time. Somehow, but the Rahula came. Then uh, he came to see the place in here, and somehow he was here uh, a week. Bhanteji was in the Washington D.C. Vihara. Somehow, a week after, when Bhanteji came to this place, but the Rahula was working very hard. Hard work was needed. Done by Bhante Rahul, and then Bhante he invited to Bhante Rahul. You also like to meditate in the forest, and uh, you are interested to practice with me to build this place. So, why you are not staying with me? <laughs> this is the way how we got invitation from Bhante. Since that day, to I think last year, he was here as a vice of 2009. Until that, he was working as a vice abbot in Bahamana society to build this place. So later on, we can talk about all other information. But uh, thank you very much, Bhante Rahula. And now we can turn into our, our agendas. Next item will be the Vinayapal Ramsrao. So monks are I hope all our day duties are in the local down for Mahavasana. 
the door can join the room. We have a rebellion outside of the banner. We are going to have something to do with the